word is what breathes life into us. And I usually have said to those who have said that to me, brother or sister, your argument is not with me. It's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. It is God's word and it is him who has said these things. And if you hearken and listen to those things, you'll end up being safe. I cannot stand down from my duty. I rejoice when I get to the soft shoe stuff. Stuff about might and power and strength and shields and, and sword fighting. And oh boy, we get to be gladiators and God's going to do great things for us and in us and to us. I rejoice when I get to that part. But I can't park there. Because that's like me telling you that you're going to be a, a great soldier for God, but not telling you there's a boot camp, and there's a training session. <laughs> now I ask you, if you go to a boot camp, what do you hear? Grunts and groans and moans of sore muscles and, and men preparing so they can go to battle. So they can say that they're a soldier. So often our training is around these things and we need to understand these things that's why we've been involved in the study of the book of Ephesians the greatest voice in the midst of all scripture <clears> of <throat> the Holy Spirit speaking to us and mandating the terms for us to stand in God's presence and hear the voice of our living God with offers and counter offers and more offers and more offers with equipping and suggestions of equipping with a, a word about changing our mindset so that we can stand right before the throne of God next to our great Lord Jesus Christ, seeing Michael far in the distance and be able to rejoice that close to the throne is an amazing offer. So we are going into Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. I could use a paper towel. No, I have one. Just turn me down for a second. Thank you. I know that looks so professional on TV. People probably wonder, who's that guy that blows his nose on? <laughs> I know one. <clears throat> but before we get into Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, there's some things that we have to understand. If we're going to be talking about armor... If we're going to be talking about an actual battle, we have to find out what are we battling? What is the armor for? Who is the armor for? And is there a battle? And who's involved in the battle? And what's the cause of the battle? And where does the battle take place? Well, we don't ask these questions often. <clears throat> I had a dream one time, and in that dream, I saw the Lord. And there was these seven steps that appeared that were wide probably I don't know two three hundred feet across and off to this side was a soft plush bed with a canopy over it like or more like a, a cushy the cushiest coziest couch that you've ever seen with little tables for setting stuff on it and on this side of the five or the seven steps was this beautiful table that the Lord was sitting at and he motioned to me come up the steps and I remember my heart palpitating, and, oh, Lord. And I ran up the steps, and he said, sit with me a while and have some bread. And he broke bread, and he poured wine, and I, I sit and drank with him. And I, I noticed somebody scurrying past both of us. We were sitting there in deep fellowship, and I, I was just, I'm eating with the Lord. He handed this bread he touched. I remember looking at it. And I look at the, the, the goblet of wine and think, he poured it in there. And he personally handed it to me. I, I look to see the fingerprints on the glass. These are, these are God's fingerprints. And I just, I wanted to burst in tears, but I want to burst with joy. But I noticed that there was some others that came past and they had no interest. He even interceded in a conversation, won't you have some bread and 
sits with me for a while. I don't, I'm busy, and they were headed. They were headed for this portico area where all these pillars and were in a circular format, with all the armor hanging on the different pillars, and they were only interested in the armor. And he said, come with me, my son, and sit with me for a while. He invited me over to the couch, and we went over to the couch and sat, and I, I don't know how long we sat. I listened to him, and it was like music and melody pouring through my soul and joys entering me and an essence of the fragrance of his smell. I can remember my dad as a kid of laying on his arm. He took a bath every night. <laughs> But he had a certain smell to him. And what a joy it was to smell him. I remember after not seeing one of my daughters for a couple of years, the first thing she did when she hugged me, she, she remembered those things too. The fragrance of him being close by is such a joy. But I watched as someone came passing by and that they again were interested in the armament. And I said, I, I don't understand. And he looked at me and he said, neither do I. I can't understand why they desire my things and my toys and my armament more than they desire me. I almost broke into tears there in his presence. Probably did. I seen one guy come by that the Lord took time to stand up and go greet. It would almost be like meeting someone of such spiritual stature as to have a complete set of armor and completely fill it. That he had skills and abilities that were so far beyond my own. He was a mature, mature man of God. Somebody that yielded the entire power and authority of God when he fought in battle. And he had been in some kind of skirmish with the enemy. And he had an arrow that had caught him and slipped right past the breastplate and entered his back. And he comes stumbling in and the Lord went over and pulled it down. They had another arrow that had actually pierced his shielding on his chest. The Lord pulled it out and healed the man. And then began to talk to him about the how the enemy had got to him. Talk to him about tactics to avoid that again. It's a pretty good thing to know, isn't it? And then he took the man's armor and took it in. And I saw a great fiery forge right in the middle of this portico. And he began to to form it and to fashion it and fire flew up through it and in it and the holes were mended in it and not just mended he added new strength to it I stood mesmerized as I watched my God make armor for his true valiant men that knew what armor was for and I almost was ashamed of some of my own crowd of being dragon chasers and just after the shields and just after all the things that was there rather than after him. So I think that we need to preclude that. What is the armor for? It's not there to distract us from his presence. It's only needed for battle. And I guess the question rises, who are we in battle with? If we're against God? And we are his enemy. I don't know if you know that or not. There are many proclamations that God gave to Israel as a result of their disobedience, as a result of their resistance, as a result of most of them not wanting to go on with him and them wanting to change his nation into something for themselves. He had great disputes with them. And as a result, he would have to bring judgments. But you remember, we talked about how difficult it would be. Here inside you is this little grain of Jesus, his son. 
but inside you is this big kernel of rebellion that belongs to Satan. And how do you how do you split that person in two so they can bring judgment to deal with the things that need to be gotten out of the way? Not judgment for, I'm going to send you to hell. Remember, Jesus didn't come to do that. He came to rescue us. He came to set us free. He came to break down prison doors. He came to rescue us. He's the rescuer. And one of the things that he needs to rescue us from is from us, from our deeds, our actions, our mindsets. Difficult task. He's ever so careful in this. I had a good demonstration of some of his difficulty today. I have some one that's especially close to me that has gravely disappointed me. Their actions and attitude and rebellion and persistence in rebellion. And it's, it's breaking my heart. I, I, Lord, what do I do about this? I, I love. Oh, I, my love reaches so deep that I see that if I don't deal with it, that this loved one is going to be injured or lost. Lost. I experienced that today. One part of me was angry and another part of me wanted to weep. One part of me wanted to deal with it, but if I did, then the loved one wouldn't understand, didn't have the capacity to receive correction. I cried out to my Lord, my, Lord, my God, and I said, Lord, I am deeply troubled inside. Because if I bring discipline or correction they cannot perceive it and if they can't perceive what it's for then what's the use in trying to give the instruction if they don't understand the words I'm perplexed because I've given this loved one lots of ground lots of room run and enjoy themselves if you haven't figured out by now I'm talking about my little dog Jack <laughs> some of you are sweating bullets <laughs> how many of you thought I was talking about you <laughs> oh this morning my mom and I got up and we went out and the sun was shining I just I just almost burst when the sun shines I I want to go out and just Praise my God. I want to go out and just stand it and look up at the blue sky and drink in the ambience of the, of the great trees that stand up in it and just a cloudless sky in the background. And I mean, when we left this morning early, it was 75 degrees and we live in the Northwest and that's impossible. <laughs> As we were driving along, Jack acted like he needed to use the restroom. He was communicating with the best skills he had. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I relate it to you that way because many times we don't know what we want. And we're crying out to God. We don't know how to express what our need is. And we don't even know what our need is. I found out he didn't need to use the restroom. He was about to burst of wanting to get out and just run. And so... We crossed the bridge there in Mount Vernon and went into that park that's on the south side. And I thought, wow, that thing's got a fence all the way around. This is great. And there was probably a half a mile across and fence all the way around. Oh, this is great. Because Jack usually stays fairly close. He'll run about a block and you holler, Jack. And he comes running back all happy and skippy-heeled and joyful and... <laughs> And he almost bumps into you as he runs past you to run the other direction for a block. And he keeps doing butterflies back and forth across your path. Today something was different. Jack was obstinate. He didn't want to. Matter of fact, he knew that if he got too close, I might shut down and, and, and go. And he was afraid of that. He knew the fence was the boundary lines, and it was uh, about five blocks away in any direction. He knew that. And the first thing he did in 
run out and run back, run out and run back. Then he ran out and he kept running and kept running. And I, Jack! And he keeps running. Jack! And he puts his head down and keeps running. And then something caught his scent. Now he's beyond the boundary that he knows he's supposed to be beyond. And now in the midst of this area that I brought him to enjoy himself, he flops over and he's rolling upside down and rolling and rolling and rolling. I mean, we were three blocks away and we're still walking. And five minutes later, he's still upside down rolling. <laughs> It brings to mind that our God is joyful to bring us into his presence. Joyful to give us, oh, look, stay close. Stay within the range of my voice because he, he wants to give us warnings. He wants to, to let us know the things that can harm us. He wants to give us as much freedom as we can handle without killing ourselves or injuring ourselves or making ourselves stink in some way. And he smelled that spot, man. He just kept going back to it and rolling and rolling and rolling. And I just thought, Lord, do I ever do that? You give me lots of freedom and there's something in that freedom that I take advantage of that stinks before you. And I go roll in it. Instead of staying within your presence, staying where it's delightful, staying where the blue sky is, staying where there's delight in him, it's true that the whole field was his and I offered it. But the terms of my offer is for him to stay within shouting distance. But he became arrogant. He didn't want to listen. He became obstinate. and He didn't want to listen. He would mm, turn away. And he would run harder, afraid he's going to have to come back. And then finally he's five blocks away and I'm, Jack! And he turns and he just makes a decision. And he sees a gate on the other side that goes into a different field. One that leads up to a road. One that's full of thorns and briars and one that he can just dis disappear into. My mother and I, our hearts kind of sank because he got on the other side of the fence and he ran for four blocks alongside that fence until he got to the highway and then he started taking off down the highway. Our dalliances can get us in some real unsafe places. Our great God wants to give us liberty. Wants and deliberately sets up a place. Do you realize the field I took him to, there was not one sticker in it. There was not one thing that could harm him. There was a fence to keep other things up. There wasn't any other animals there to eat him. On the other side, there was other stray dogs. The other side, there's cars that can run over him. And he didn't understood or understand. And, and, and finally, I I'm, I'm tell Mama, here's the keys. You'll go get the van. You drive up this road, that road, and I'll meet you up there because I'm going to head that direction where he went and head up that road and start seeing if I can get, at least catch a glimpse of him. But Jack is fast. He's faster than most horses. He's fast. Meanwhile, I'm still hollering, Jack, come back. Jack, come back. Oh, Jack, Jack, Jack. And finally, even a angry, Jack. What am I trying to do? He knows I'm trying to get him to come. And I can tell you whatever expression our Lord has to use, he's just trying to get us to come and stay within the safe zone of our lives in him he's calling he's calling with great anxiety sometime i can tell you my mother and i had great anxiety she had so much she had to sit down she thought jack was lost i didn't think he was totally lost but i can tell you within a week this is the second time he's done this we took him out to another field in the valley one that's like a mile and a half by a mile and a half. And what does he do? He wants to run to the next field that's a cornfield so he can disappear in the corn. Why? What's in the cornfield that's not in the field that I brought him in? 
field I took him in was a field of clover and some loose hay here and there, which was guaranteed to have some rodents, which what he, is what he wanted. But he has to go, oh, that's taller grass. There's bound to be bigger rats in there. I tell you, if you're hunting for big rats, you'll find them. Or they'll find you. I'm giving you this for an understanding that our God has some situations that sometimes makes him heart sick that he has to make decisions with us. It's not his want, it's not his desire. He doesn't have any interest. I had no interest in chastising Jack. I had no interest in wanting to argue with him. I, I had no interest. I earnestly wanted to convey to the little fella to keep him safe. And, the, and, and convey to him that he's a great joy in my life and I really love him dearly. And it just makes me panic-stricken to think I would lose this little guy. He was rebellious as he is. He is a Jack Russell. Jack's come a long ways from being a Jack Russell. And when he gets too far out there, he loses his mindset that he has a master and he turns into a dog. Scripture reference for dog means that they don't have a master. Most Israelis did not keep dogs. It was a reference to someone who likes to wonder. It was a reference to someone who wanted no master. It was a reference to someone who wanted to eat where they wanted to eat, eat when they wanted to eat, go where they wanted to go. It was a reference to someone, poor character, that didn't want to stay within the bounds that God has set. I say that for a reason. We're Gentiles, and the Gentiles were referred to as the dogs. And I can tell you that we didn't have a covenant with God. We come in as dogs, wanderers, self-opinionated, self-purpose, self-this and self-that. Our God has, has plans to change that within us so that we can be saved from being a dog and be turned into one of his little sheep. Sheep that he cares for. Now, with that thought in mind, the reason I'm laying this out this way because many times as dogs we've run into and tried to put on armor and a dog cannot wear armor, can he? A dog cannot lift a shield. He didn't have the capacity to. A dog cannot lift a bow or a sword. A dog, even if he gets to where these things of armament are that are defensive mechanisms, has no ability to be able to implement them. Nor can he sense who the enemy is because anybody that's got a bone's his friend. And I can tell you who's got the biggest bones, and that's the enemy. God doesn't deal in bones. He deals in fresh fruit. <coughs> and dogs don't like fruit. <coughs> I let Jack uh, do the pre-wash on my breakfast plate the other morning, and I, I noticed that he left the raspberry jelly. I don't understand that. He picked the spot where the sausage was, but left the raspberry jelly. In our dog nature, we do not like the vineyard nor the fruit that God has for us. Instead, we want the things the world has for us. Now, my purpose in giving you this prelogue before we get into the armor is that we can understand that our God has to get us into the mode of realizing, one, we're in a battle. Two, he's trying to rescue us. Three, he sends the armies. Never realized that before. You realize every armory that ever attacked Israel, God sent. He was having that army attack some wickedness, right? So that the nation could turn away from the wickedness so that they could dwell in the land with their God. They had lost the presence of God. The enemy shows up on the border who God sent from some, I don't know, I'll take you nation out there. Then after you get through doing something to them, I'm going to torture you. <laughs> but he was trying to bring correction to the faithful. And those who were faithful turned to him. They did. They cried out to him. He said, hey, I'm sending them. They're going to be warriors on your board. They're going to be surrounding your cities. And you need to get down and moan and cry and bewail yourself of this current situation that you're in because you got yourself in this. And what is he trying to make them understand? Turn from it. Change the situation. That's all he's looking for is change. 
If he was out ready to just torch us, he would have already done that. I've done enough to be torched 87 million times. I've done enough to be torched every day for the next 80 million years. Now, you may have exceeded that. Or you may only have 20 million owed you. But our God is a gracious God. So with that, I'm going to read some things that hopefully will wake up our souls that there's a true battle our God is in it, and the enemy's in it, and we're in it. And if we're in it, we need to understand there's offensive weapons and defensive weapons. But there's also a place that we acquire those. There's a place that we wear those. There's a way we do these things. But before we can get to the armor, don't we have to look at how to acquire it and why we need it? Jeremiah 4 and 30. God asked the question, What are you doing Oh, devastated one. Why dress yourself in scarlet and put on jewels of gold? Why shade your eyes with paint? You adorn yourself in vain. See, that's the things of the world. We can see that's a harlot. But what we don't understand is our, our actions when we shade our eyes from his light and we don't want to quite come into it, you know. <laughs> There's more shading besides putting on makeup. When we skirt his truth to establish our own. He says, your lovers despise you. And I can tell you this. Every flaky, weak-kneed Christian out there. Every coward that's a Christian. I can tell you, Satan hates you. The evil people of this world that are truly want to do evil... You're despised and hated, even if you join with them in their revelry. They'll think, yeah, you lousy, no good, low, bald Christian think you're such a good thing. They despise you. Every evil thing that we want to participate, the world looks at us and despises us. Let me read that to you again. Why shade your eyes with paint? You adore, adorn yourself in vain. Your lovers despise you. What we love, our pleasures, the things we seek, at, truly despises us. Any pleasure that you have that's greater than God, it despises you and you don't have a clue. It's burning up your time. When you stand before God, you're going to say, Oh, oh, I, I burned up you know, 800,000 hours that I could have been worshiping you. 800,000 hours I, I could have been standing in your presence. If you're into choo-choo trains and you've spent your 800,000 hours collecting choo-choos, I know men that have whole basements full of choo-choo trains all around. Woo, woo, woo. They just go around in a circle. Now, some of them got some real expensive when they can back up. <laughs> some of them got some real expensive when they have little cranes and things on them and, and real little fake scenes and little mountains and and they stand before God. They say, so your God was a choo-choo train, huh? Now that's just plumb moronic. Is it not? And you'll see the truth of it. That you could have been standing in the most fascinating place there is in the universe. Having encounters with him rather than playing with choo-choo trains. We'll see it for as what it is. Because it's Jeremiah 4 and 22. Jeremiah just didn't mince words. God says, my people are fools. They do not know me. And I can tell you, if you don't know him on a personal level, you qualify. It's because you think you have your fire insurance. It's not going to matter whether you know him. It's whether he knows you. And he says, they don't know me. And those people who do not know him. He says, they are senseless children. Senseless means they can't sense him. They can't talk to him. They don't hear him. They're not crying out to him. Senseless. No spiritual senses. Some of us have church sensors. Some of us can tell where to park the car. You remember those old cars in the 50s that had the cat whiskers on them? It was a metal rod that stuck out. It was a little spring, and when you pull up next to the curb, it drags so, because the tires were pretty touchy back then. If you ran over a curb, you'd blow the sidewall out. <laughs> but they would scrape 
along the curb. Many of us, that's about the only senses we have. When we hit metal against metal, we know, you know, I think I'm supposed to stop here. They got a rule in Texas, just back up till you hear metal and then you can go forward. <laughs> I think that's a Christian rule too. Back up till you hear metal. Screeching and wailing and hurting and you run over somebody. Unbeknownst to you, it may have been something precious to you. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children and they have no understanding. They're skilled in doing evil. Do you realize how skilled we are in doing evil? Oh, that we could become skilled in doing what was right before God. There's what he's trying to get us to see. He's not ridiculing us. He's saying, you don't have, you're, you're senseless and you don't understand. You're skilled in this area and resisting me. You're skilled in the area of finding the gate. Jack found the gate. There's three miles of fence around there and he finds two gates. And he wants on the other side of the fence to run on it. And I'm just thinking, oh, Jack, don't you understand? The skilled in doing evil. What he did was evil. He looked at me with intent. Yeah, I know you're my master, but I'm going this way. Is that not an evil act? He did it with intent. I've never seen Jack do many things with intent. If you could communicate to him, he usually doesn't resist. He said, oh, oh, okay. He, for the first time, made a decision. Not for the second time. The day in the cornfield was another time. He got to the edge of that. I called him. He was within 200 feet of me. And he looks at me, and he just looks at the cornfield, looks at me, and just shrugs me off and takes off. And I'm talking to him. Is that evil? They are God when he's speaking to us. And we resist. It's evil. We made a, just a real decision. No, I am not doing it. I am not ready to go. I know you're, you're going to stop me from having my fun. And if he hadn't have done that, I probably would have stood in the field for two hours and got me a chair until the little guy was just pump played out. It was my intent to take him somewhere where he could get the woo-hoo out of his system. Our God has intent to let us enjoy ourselves and to bring us into joyful places. Problem is we breach the boundaries real quick. We run out and roll in something. We run off, find a gate, go out. Then when I'm off down the street, I see him heading back. He went up that four blocks, headed through some briar, got all tangled in those, comes out the other side, another four blocks, and then comes running back across the field. By the time my mother's almost to the car, and then he sees two other dogs on the other side of that field and makes a decision, oh, well, I'm not going that way. I'm going to those other two dogs, and he gets in a fight. These were big dogs. These guys were serious, and Jack's not serious about anything. <laughs> he was upside down like, ah, arr, arr. <laughs> what happened? I, I, I just was running in the field. Oh, you had no master. You were a dog. You wondered. You wanted to do it your own way. And I can tell you that if we're wanderers and we're dogs... We'll never find our way into the presence of God to get the armor we need for the army that's coming. Listen to this in Jeremiah 4.14. O Jerusalem, wash the evil from your heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? Do you know what harbor, a harbor is? It's a safe place where you keep something safe. I can go over to Anacortes and there's a couple of different harbors over there. And they have put up intentional shielding to keep any waves out so that they can keep their toys safe. And there's some multi-million dollar toys in there, is there not? And that's the thing. See, there's something that's special to us. And we make a safe harbor for it and keep God's hand from touching it. We don't want Him to touch our way of doing our things. We don't want His insight we don't want his direction. We don't want his suggestion when we want to go off and do something. And the reason I'm hitting this so hard, you've got to understand, if we're going to ask for access into the presence of God where these things are, none of these things can be in us. 
We have no access if we're a dog. We have no armor. No wonder the enemy can ride through and shoot you full of arrows. No wonder the enemy can plan your future so easy and mine if we're going to be a dog because we have no defenses. We have a harbor full of evil of our own desires, our ways, our pleasures. And if the harbor is there, God's waves, we're preventing him from getting it and getting rid of it. And we're saying, oh, don't judge that. Don't judge that harbor. Uh, that, that's my harbor. I, I need to go out and kick my heels up. I need, the, I need to do this. I need to feel good about myself. I, I need this. That's what Jack was saying. It was pretty simple. Oh, I'm doing this. And off he goes. Heels kicked up, and there was a difference in his stature as he ran off. That was a rebellious stature that formed him. His run was different. His walk was different. His gallop was a rebellion. I thought, wow. It was like a, <laughs> I'm free. I made up my own decision. He harbored something. Read the passage again. Jeremiah 14, 414. Oh, Jerusalem, wash the evil from your heart and be saved. Now, how are we washed? By the word. So what Jesus said. Peter says, oh, you know, he's going to wash his feet. Oh, no, Lord. Then the Lord said, you don't understand. Unless I wash your feet, you're not clean. Oh, well, wash my whole body. Yeah, you know, good old Peter. Open mouth, insert all four feet. <laughs> I say that because he was, had a dog nature at the time. And the Lord says, you don't understand, Peter. If you're with me, because you've been with me. You've been washed. The only thing I need to wash is the part of you that walks in the world and makes contact with it. Let me do it my way. If your heart's going to be changed and saved, it's going to have to be washed, and the only place it can be washed is close to Jesus, Him touching you, you touching Him. Remember, I was sitting at the table eating bread. I was being washed. I went and sat on the sofa with Him and talked for hours and hours and hours on end. I was being washed. That's why it's important we come to these washings. They're washings our soul needs. that unravels us deep, deep inside. And he makes this statement. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? A voice is announcing from Dan. Dan means judgment in the Hebrew. Proclaiming disaster from the hills of Ephraim. I don't know. Do you know who Ephraim is? Ephraim and Manasseh? They were Joseph's two sons, and God gave a double portion to Joseph for the two sons. You notice there's not a tribe of Joseph. <laughs> the reason being, there was a tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh is believed to be the end-time Jews that come to God. Ephraim is believed to be the Gentiles that were engrafted in and given a part when they had no part coming. That's you and I. So he says, a voice is announcing a judge. Who's the judge? Jesus is. Proclaiming disaster from the hills of Ephraim. In other words, from the hills of us as Gentiles. Tell this to the nation. That's Gentiles in the Hebrew. Proclaim it to Jerusalem. A besieging army is coming from a distant land Raising a war cry against the cities of Judah. Now, who's the cities of Judah? If you praise God and you worship God, Judah was considered, that means praise, praise to God. Judah goes before God. And the war cry, because of the evil that we harbor, the enemy is coming against those who even praise. If you have something in your harbor, now if you don't have anything in your harbor, the, the enemy's not coming after you. We need to get rid of the harbor, don't we? Blow it up. <laughs> now, we're seeing Guns of Navarro or any of those good movies with lots of explosive things going on. We need some of those spiritual explosives to blow us out of our complacency and sink every vessel in our little harbor. We need to see it for what it is. That God is sending waves and we'll send waves against it. If we detach ourselves from it, the judgment will not touch us because God wants and has a good life for us. He wants to rescue us. From the waves that will come. Who sent the waves? He does. Who sends the army? He does. 
But if we depart and get rid of the harbor, it's not coming against us. It'll just destroy the harbor. Now, if I'm going back up to his foothills and not in my foothills, you see, the judgment was because of the foothills of Ephraim. <laughs> I need to get back to the mountain of God, not to the mountain of my so-called converted Christianity. That would be the foothills. He said, tell this to the nations, to the Gentiles. Proclaim it to Jerusalem. A besieging army is coming from a distant land, raising a war cry against the cities of Judah. They surround her like men guarded in a field, or guarding a field. Now that's a pretty thick surrounding, is it not? It means every direction you look. And I promise you, if you're in a field that's a mile in circumference and you got men shoulder to shoulder with their guns pointed at you, you're pretty surrounded. He's saying, that's what's coming. He says, because she has rebelled against me, declares the Lord. Now, God never declares anything unless he gives them a way out. Unless he gives them a chance to change it. Change, save yourself from this. Matter of fact, he says in Chronicle, 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, For the eyes of the Lord are ranging throughout the earth. Stop right there. Look at me. His eyes are ranging and many people think, oh, he's looking at me. I'm, I'm so scared because he's looking at me. Look what he's ranging for. Go back to the scripture. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I want him to be looking at me. I want his eyes. I need strengthening. But his eyes won't look at me unless I'm fully committed. I'm committed to stop doing those things that would push him away. I'm committed to stop doing those things that tick him off. I'm committed to do things his way. I'm committed to find out where are these boundaries that please you, Lord. Because if I can find the boundaries and I understand what he's trying to communicate to me, there's no place I can't walk if I stay within shouting distance of him. And that'd be a soft shout. I don't want to be far enough away that he has to holler at the top of his lungs. Most of us stay on that peripheral edge of, okay, you know, stop me if I'm not supposed to do this. <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear anything. I guess it's okay, honey. <laughs> We're out there on that peripheral edge. And I, I, I'm sure the Lord is not dismayed like I was with Jack of going, Oh, Jack, Jack, if you only understood, I arranged my time to bring you out here to the wide place it gives me great joy to see him kick up his heels and run and snoot full of the air it's almost like he passes by when he comes zooming by going Woo <laughs> and I can tell you when he does and he buzzes me like that I do it for him I go Woo go Jack and he pours on the speed all the more yeah <laughs> you can see it in him, the excitement and the zeal of, of being free within, within the bonds of our union. There's zeal, there's great joy if we're free within the bonds of our union. When we get outside that, it can be unsafe for us and it can grieve our great king. His eyes are constantly searching to strengthen. Show your faithfulness to him. If you need strengthening, Jack needs to sense my love more so that the love tie can draw him back and he'll respond more. I found out Jackie was explaining to me the terrier syndrome mind that if you really get down on him and get harsh with him, now they'll just sulk and sink into themselves and they won't respond. I just don't have a nature that can handle hard instruction. I mean, if he was running out in front of a car, I have to make a decision. If all I can do, and I'm chasing after him, to kick him with my foot to keep him from going in front of the car, he's not going to understand the kick is he I'm telling you there's some time we are full bore headed for hell 
and God with his foot <laughs> trips us or has to do something to keep us from injuring ourselves. And, and for the most part, we don't appreciate it. We got that Jack Russell blood. I watched the airplane version of Brother, Where Art Thou? There's one guy in there that betrays another guy that was his cousin. And he finally, both of them get caught, and the other guy, Paul, well, I'm sorry, I, I betrayed you. I told them where you were at and where the treasure's at, and he said, it's just my hogwaller blood. We've got hogwaller blood. We betray our Lord and our Master. But if we'll just make commitment of Lord, I will be faithful to you. I will respond to your call. I'll watch myself so I don't go too far. But Lord, will you give me time at that bread and table thing and, and on the couch? Because I need the love tie and the love bond built deeper between you and I. So I can feel it. So I can, I'll respond to your come. Jack and I have a real close relationship. I, I don't think I've ever really even spanked the little guy. I've tried to do everything out of love and treats today I really thought do I need to give you a spanking would you understand that I looked at him and I thought you know you wouldn't even comprehend it if it would do you some good to keep you from doing that I, I would do that but it grieves my soul what you've done Jack I was talking to him as we were walking back in the car and I said oh Jack it grieves my soul you have lost so much freedom by your two disobediences. Freedom that I intentionally planned for you. Freedom and to run and freedom to do what would thrill your soul. That you wanted to do it on your terms. I grieve inside. But I have hope that my God has a plan. Because his eyes are on me. Because I try to be faithful to him. I may fail, but I try to be faithful. I have this hope in my heart. Jack tries to be faithful. If I can just embrace that love bond between he and I a little bit deeper, maybe I can coax him through that love bond and strengthen him to stay a little bit closer. If I can, then there stands a chance that I can open up to let him have more territory, more ground. Second Corinthians 10 and 3, it says, We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power. What kind of power? Divine power. To demolish. Does that mean anything is left? Strongholds. The strongholds can be self-will. The stronghold can be the, the enemy itself that has taught us to do things in error our own way. There is some divine power that can help demolish these strongholds that we have in our lives. As we demolish arguments and every pretensions, I want you to know Every promise of God and instruction of God and freedom of God and joy of God, there's some sort of argument against it from Satan for us to do something else other than what will please God that we'll get joy out of. There's some argument that he gives us. So there was some argument that went through Jack's mind of, but I, I can go do this and, and my master be right there. And I know he's aggravated, but I, I'll run and do this. I can, I can run and make it, get it back to him. Because I know he's going to get in that car and probably he's going to go. And I'm not ready to go. He was arguing. He was listening to himself and going through some reasoning skills that we all go through when we're faced with Am I going to do it my way? But I want you to know that divine power can help demolish those arguments because if you get rid of the arguments, now you won't do it. If you get rid of the arguments, you'll win in the battle against Satan. He's the one that gives us the arguments. He's the one that comes in and pre presents us with some 
mind loop equation that's going to justify why we will turn and go to the bushes. He's going to present us with some equation of why we go out in the field and roll in something. He's going to pre but if, if we seek our God and if we're faithful to him and his eyes are upon us, then he's going to empower us to demolish those arguments. And if those arguments are out of the way, now I can see the truth. And I, I, I look at that and I think, well, no, I don't want to go there. My master's, he's calling me. He loves me. He's got a treat in his pocket. Our God will use everything he can to attract our attention. We, we demolish arguments and every pretension that suffs itself up against the knowledge of God. And I can tell you, if we don't resolve the issue of the arguments and the pretensions that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, we'll never have access to where the shield is, where the, ar where the armor is, where the sword of truth is. We'll never have access to that. Many Christians have lied to themselves, and I've seen the name it and claim it world. People live like children of hell towards each other and towards life and all their actions and deeds with some form of religion of going to worship God, but they, being Judah, just gave praise to their lips. They didn't give praise with the actions of their body. They weren't faithful with the actions of their body. Their body was elsewhere, but yet their lips were, oh, I can praise you from over here. That's what Jack was probably thinking. Well, I can, I can, I'll just be over here. I can, I, can, I can think about you over here in the bushes. It says we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. See, there's thoughts that come in our little heads that need to be captured and brought into the obedience of Christ. Of, My Lord wouldn't like that. I'm not going to do that. It's taking that thought captive because it's the thought and the arguments that are in the mind that lead us astray, that make us harbor the things. And what's coming against the harbor? You better sell the harbor. <laughs> you better blow up all the boats in it. You don't want anything to escape. You don't want anything to escape because if it escapes, it'll come back and you'll make another harbor for it. My will, my way, my thought process. Now I want you to know in Hebrews 4 and 12, it says, for the word of God is living and active. That's why I need to stay close to him. So I can hear his word. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And what that means is God's word, see, when it, when it talks about the dividing of the soul and the spirit, your soul, whose spirit Satan is, it's not a capital spirit, we need God's word to come and say, no, that's the enemy speaking to you. That's not your voice. We need to realize, it, it, in one translation it talks about it, it separates the, the thought from the intent. I'm the thinker. I'm just a computer. Where did the intent come from? Wasn't it Satan that leads us astray? Isn't that his job? Isn't that what he does? And Satan, the tempter, that says, come and do it this way. So there's more input, the, that intent. So God's sword of his word, if we can stay in his presence, his word is close enough to decipher the difference between my thought and what Satan has to say for me to think about. And it cuts it in two. So I realize, well, hey, Satan is saying that. That's not me. I, no, I don't want to go. There's my, oh, Lord, there you are. But he has to be close enough for me to respond. He has to be close enough for that word to penetrate my heart. Remember I, I shared with you in the last session that uh, Peter, when he stepped out on the water, was it his faith? No. It was the Lord speaking. He stepped on the word of Jesus when Jesus said, Come to me, Peter. He stood on the word of God. So even if we're in shaky ground and high waves, and I want you to know that boat was 30 feet long and those waves were probably 30 feet high because they were breaking up over the bow of the boat. And I promise you, waves are breaking up over the bow of the boat. The waves are that big. <laughs> and now he steps out on rough water, out of the safety of the boat. That's not fate. 
That's a God calling. That's us standing on the Word of God. So this word of us being close to Jesus is important that we can hear him because those who cannot hear him do not go in the armament room. You don't turn a bunch of kids loose in an arsenal of weapons that really have power and authority. I saw a whole group of people go astray in their own authority thinking they were doing it in God's authority. I saw real immaturity, a bunch of little wacky kids saying, Oh, I, I command this to happen. I command that to happen. I command this. And I, 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 wait a minute. I? Who's I? What's I in this for? I saw them bringing railing accusation against Satan, which is a celestial being. I'm going to kick your teeth in. Come here and fight. <laughs> you no good piece of trash. God's going to put you under. My, I'm going to crush you under my heel. Come here, Satan. I've seen him do all kinds. Now, what is that? That's arrogance, is it not? That has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. There was some real wrong teaching that come forward about the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, and the offensive and the defensive weapons. And we need to figure out what these things are for. But we can't even get in there unless our heart and our mind are right and our attitudes are right. There's no need for us to drag some sword and go get it. And the thing, we're this little kid that's three feet tall and we've got this six-foot sword, a broad sword, that maybe weighs 70 pounds. I don't think that's going to work too good, do you? So we need to grow up and understand that we've got to deal with the hearts and minds. We've got to do the first part of this passage of Scripture. God's Word is going to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of a heart. We need it judged. You need your thoughts and your attitudes judged. If we're going to learn to turn from being a dog and come in to being a spirit-led person that can literally wear the armor. There has to be a change in our heart and our attitude from the dog nature to the sheep nature. That's the first prerequisite before we can tackle these passages of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Listen to this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. What's the armor for? To take the stand against the devil's schemes. It doesn't say to go attack Satan. It says to take a stand against his schemes. And you cannot take a stand against his schemes unless you know where to stand. Unless you know how to stand. I don't think that if you went to battle at sea, ah, I'm fighting Satan. I'm going to do it in a tank. You just picked the wrong weapon. You're at sea, and the tank will sink and take you down with it. I don't think if you were in the desert, you'd think, okay, I need a weapon. You're not going to drag a submarine out there and defeat anybody. It goes nowhere in the desert. When you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's not time to set off a thermal nuclear device to destroy the enemy. <laughs> and many of us want to do that. There are many defensive weapons, many offensive weapons. So don't you think that we need to make some discovery about these things? It says, for our struggles, not against flesh and blood. Number one, it's not against any human being. But I've seen in the charismatic realm, people commanding people, people commanding spirits, people out of their own authority. When it's supposed to be the mind of God and the Spirit of God that does these things. Because I, I literally witnessed casting out spirits and spirits coming back to people with him bringing seven others. Why? Because God didn't contract for you to do that. You did that on your own so you could go, woohoo, look at there, I cast out some demons. I remember standing on, standing in the kitchen of some friends one time. It happened at Butch and Brenda's house, matter of fact. But a girl from India that had received Jesus. Her name was Preet. She had been touched by him and transformed by him. The word was 
changing her and the Spirit of God was growing within her to the point that she was almost ready to birth. But she was probably five months in the womb. And we had a couple of name it and claim it people that, it, oh, we've, we've been down in the Caribbean casting out demons, raising the dead, healing the sick. Said, oh, you, you got any pictures? Because it was all flimmery. Do you know what that word is? <laughs> now, believe me, I believe in casting out demons. But when my father says only. I believe in healing the sick. But when Jesus says do it and not until. I don't think one thing that we do in God's name should be done when we want it done. Everything Jesus did, he looked up and saw his father doing, and that's where we in the charismatic trouble got in great trouble with God. We started doing things in his name he didn't say do. Most of those things were for our own vainglory and our own, verb, our own purposes. That's not where we're going, but a little freebie there for you to think on. Our fight's not against flesh and blood. What are you? Your flesh and blood. Your fight's not against yourself. Our fight is not against husbands and wives because they're flesh and blood. Our fight is not against the government, the people in this government, because they're flesh and blood. So what's our fight against? It's against the demonic forces in this world that really walk to and fro, that have access to your thoughts in your mind and watch your every action and your deed. The only place that's safe is when you're in Jesus' presence and then they cry out, Oh, let us flee from here. Unless you want to harbor one. Now, you don't have to be possessed, demon-possessed, for these guys to speak to you. They're Mr. Incognito and stand at distance and quickly run in every time you get angry or want your way and do a quick download of where you're at on their radar and do a quick download of their suggestions in case you get into certain scenarios. Do you believe Scripture? Because it says our fight's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you believe God or not? You've got to make a decision here. He says that is the total place that our fight is supposed to be against. So what are all the weapons made for? For us to be able to stand. I've listed for you in yellow one, two, three, four times in this little passage of Scripture that God makes a, makes a statement. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. They're put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, it's going to come. You may be able to stand your ground. You've got to have ground to stand. And I can tell you, if it's a safe harbor for hidden evil, it's not ground that you can protect. God's tidal wave is coming to that hidden harbor. His armies are going to surround that hidden harbor. So that hidden harbor is not going to do you any good. So he says, stand your ground. So where is your ground? What ground are you standing on? And after you've done everything to stand, then stand firm. Now Jack had a whole open field he could have gone to. A whole open field that if he would have thought about it, where he should have been was closer in to me. That would have been safe ground. And anywhere within my voice range, he could begin to build a fortress of safety. He was already in safety just simply because he was close to me. Anything that would come around, I would take care of. He wouldn't even have to do it. And if the enemy came around, all he has to do is pull back and get in my presence. Where's your ground? 1 Corinthians 6 and 14. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage and be strong and do everything in love. Second Timothy 2 and 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard me say and in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach us. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. What are pleasures of this life? Are they civilian affairs? You need to go around and write on those things that give you pleasure that is God-less. Less God. 
He's not in your choo-choo engine room. He doesn't go in your choo-choo engine room. He doesn't get pleasure out of choo-choo engines. He gets pleasure out of those things that please him in the heavenlies. And where is our eyes and gaze supposed to be fixed? Upwardly. Into the upwardly call of God. And now he picks of how I'm supposed to be entertained or enter into joy. And does God know that you need? You have a genuine need. He made you with a need to see great things, to see wondrous things, to, to, to things that will thrill your heart. Does he know you have that need? Does he know that you need joy? He made you with that need. And I tell you that that need can only be filled in him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. There's the key to this. But we can't even begin to put on the full armor of God until we can take our stand. But you can't take your stand until you put on the full armor of God. Is that a perplexity situation? No, it's not. It's pointed out in Philippians chapter 3, which I don't know how long we've been going, Tristan. An hour and five minutes. Oh, too bad. We won't get into that. If we're going to be strong in His mighty power, we must understand that that's through the Spirit of God only. Before we can put on the armor, we must understand where the battle is at, where to stand, when to stand, and how to stand. Philippians chapter 4 makes a statement. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord. I put that in there, Philippians chapter 4, because it has the secret in it of how to stand or how to prepare to stand in the book of Philippians chapter 3. In our next session, we're going to be covering that and how it's connected so that we can prepare ourselves and our minds for actions to begin to put on the undergarments. Actions of how to change the heart and the mind and the purposes. Actions that will become pleasing to God so he allows us into the armament room. We need some defenses against the schemes of Satan. We cannot get into the armament room to receive those defenses if we're harboring self-will, self-thoughts. I want to go over some self things that will keep us from making some headway and being in the presence of the living God. But I can tell you that we'll be covering that in our next session. It'll take me another 45 minutes to get to that point, and it would not do justice. So if you're interested in learning how you can actually wear a shield and how you can put on a helmet, what it looks like and what it's for, if you're interested in how to use these things, we must do some self-examination. Are you a dog? If you are, admit it. Because a dog has no right to the armor. A dog has no right to anything that belongs to God. A dog has no rights in the presence of God. And if your dog doesn't have any rights in the presence of God, it is sure not going to be wearing a helmet. It is sure not going to be dragging a sword around. But now, our Jesus has a plan to transform us from the dog nature into a spirit-led nature into the mind of Christ because only the mind of Christ can the helmet fit. Only the body of Christ that's yielded for Christ can the armor fit upon. So he has a plan to transform us into that and we're going to have to look at that plan before we can look at the armor. No need in running in and look at the armor and everybody go, woohoo! And you walk out and well, that was, that was great and man, we talked about the armor and, and, and you're still getting beat up, you're still getting shot, you're still getting, and, and all that stuff is, it's behind your cart tied on like a tin can. You're headed your way and it just makes noise and we're dragging it down the highway saying, look at our armor. But if the enemy is truly stifled, if there's power and authority and God in you and you're able to do the works of God and you're able to see the enemy approach. Can you see him approach? I'm telling you, you're supposed to have eyes to see the enemy approach before you ever get to the armor. You're supposed to have eyes spiritual enough to see the enemy because what good is it to have armor if you don't know which way to turn the shield? 
What good is it to put on a helmet if you don't know which way to put it on? You understand? So we will go deep into what needs to change for our precepts to change for us to acquire these instruments from God. They're powerful instruments. Powerful things that can stop the enemy from planning your life. If your life runs and you try to catch up with it, the enemy is doing lots of planning and you're not seeing him. Because our fight's not against flesh and blood. If you have a runaway schedule and no time for God, the enemy has planned your schedule. And if the enemy is planning your schedule and you can't see him, know this, you don't have a shield. Know this, you don't have a helmet. If you're so driven to be off in the world, the helmet protects the ears and the mind from the influences of Satan. And if you're running off and doing your own thing and your own pleasures, you got no helmet on. The enemy's thoughts are piercing your mind because you're doing the enemy's work rather than standing in God's presence. Do you understand that statement? So we can do an honest evaluation of ourselves, and we need to. Now, some of you may have acquired a little something here, a little something there. But you're not a combat soldier. Think of the battles that you lost. If you'd have truly had that armor on, you'd have had spiritual experiences in God's presence. I told you about the person I saw with true armor. He had access into God's presence. He could take an arrow and not blink. He came in, he came in and he didn't act like, uh, uh, arrow, arrow, oh, 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 I was doing it for you. He didn't come in like that. He came in, Master, I did not do well in this battle. He made no even point that he had these things stuck in him. His mind and his heart and his thoughts were for his God. Do you see the difference? Our God wants to equip us to be soldiers for Him, not soldiers for ourselves. But unless we're involved and stop involving ourselves in civilian affairs, how can we ever get to the point that we are a soldier for our living God and we can take an arrow and not even blink? Why? Because we have access into our God's presence and He can pull it out and it doesn't matter if it hurts or not. He can re-strengthen us. This guy was serious. He wanted to be in his God's presence. He basked in his God's presence. But that was not his form and his function. He had spent his time on his bench with God and he had spent his time at the table and God said, this is not the time. Let me repair your shield and let me teach you some tactics here because I want you to go defeat the enemy. I sat and watched. I was a child. I was young. I was in my God's presence watching these things. And it gave me a semblance of understanding. Wow, I don't need that shield up there till I grow into it. And I need it filled with fire and the fury of God so that the enemy can be defeated. I don't need to take it before it has fire in it. I don't need to yield any of these instruments until I am capable. I need to stay in my God's presence and learn from Him and come into obedience because without obedience, all I do is take the equipment off and say, Shoot me, Satan! Or better yet, I say, let me harbor you in my heart. I've got a safe harbor because I like to do this and this and this. And Ah, oh, Jesus covers that. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. Because if the enemy can get close enough, he didn't have to shoot an arrow. He just takes a dagger and sticks you in the heart and every time you get close to God. This equipment is for us. It is obtainable. I've seen many obtain some of these things and misuse them for their own glory. Misuse them and become frustrated. Misuse them, not knowing where the battle's at and what it's for. They were just excited because all, oh, and, and they wanted to be this comparison thing of, oh, I got this spiritual gift, and I got this spiritual gift, oh, I've got this spirit. I, and, and it was this one-up thing of who's got the most spiritual gifts. There was a one-up thing of who can give the best prophecy, who can give the best tongue. There was just all this one-up stuff. Now I ask you, is that of God? Our, my God will not stand in that presence of that kind of slime stuff. Where selfish ambition is, every evil exists. 
selfish ambition, self-exaltation, we're going to go into those in our next step because we have to look at these things and make discovery of them and how the Lord can divest us of those things so we can have access, number one, to Him, to be trained by Him, and number two, into the armament room. Oh, I tell you, there's a flood and there's a tide that's been released by God of the enemy. We see it sweeping across the nation. We see it taking church after church. The word of God is falling by the wayside. The church looks no different and acts no different than the whores and the prostitutes of this world. They have their hands covered over their eyes and their eyes covered of no. I, I, it doesn't matter if I do evil. I can do evil and still belong to Jesus. They've lost their defenses. The armies are coming. And I'm telling you, the enemy is a mighty foe. And when God gets involved and he sins, we need to be as far away from this enemy as we can get. And we need to get defensive weapons. There are some tough days that are coming ahead, but they'll be delightful in God if you're close to him. There are some tough days coming and you can see it church after church, growing in numbers, but God not being there. You can't tell the difference in a hell's angel and a member of some of the churches. You can't tell the difference between going down and seeing the prostitutes on the street and the children of the people that are in the house of God looking like prostitutes because their parents are prostitutes before they're God. The tide is already coming. The enemy is encamped. We're surrounded. We desperately need we desperately need these shields. We desperately need these offensive and defensive weapons. But I'm telling you, unless we get the right mindset, Jerusalem, the people of Israel, missed the mindset. And by missing the mindset, they had no defenses. Even though God was their God, they had no defenses. So we must deal with our mindset first. And when we deal with the mindset and see the liberty that our God has for us, the joys He has for us, the defenses that He has set. He's being our shield right now while we're being transformed from a dog into a man of God. When Jack was a dog, today I still was his shield. I was running across an open field to intercept two big dogs, one a pit bull and the other a rottweiler. I was ready to tackle both of them for him. God intervened because I couldn't get there quick enough and gave him sense. I need out of here. <laughs> I need to leave now. <laughs> and he'd already been nipped. He'd already been upside down. He'd already been flipped. If you need a different mindset, your God can enable you. Your God can have training for you. But you have to know there is a battle. And the enemy is coming. And God can make a safe place for you. I hope that you think on these things seriously. Because your life is at risk and your children's lives are at risk. Your future is at risk. But God wants to take the risk out of it and say, hide in me. Come to me. Learn of these things. Take on the mindset that can hold up the helmet of... Take on a body of Christ that can hold the belt of truth. I'm telling you, my fleshly body cannot hold up the belt of truth. There's no truth in my flesh. I have to have the body of Christ. It has to live within me to hold up the belt of truth. These weapons, if I can wear them, can keep the enemy at bay. We'll go in more into this in our future studies. Shall we bow our hearts before the Lord? Lord, we humbly come before you and admit, Lord, we are dogs at best. But Lord, you rescue the dogs. You said you would rescue the Gentiles. And even though I'm a dog, oh Lord, I claim I belong to you. I will be obedient to you. You're my master. I won't run from you. I won't wander away. I won't go eat what I want when I want. I will do it your way. Well, you are my great king, so I trust you that you'll transform me from this dog nature into a nature that is a true son, a friend, a servant, a slave, that I might partake in the wholeness of your nature. You have made the way. 
for all these things to take place to us, your Ephraim. We will not resist your hands. We will close the harbors. We will openly confess these things to you because you're gracious, you're great, and you're the only one that keeps the enemy away. We cry out to you. Keep us safe while you train us. Keep us close. Holler at us at the top of your lungs if you need to. But, oh God, give us the grace and the strength to respond to you and come close so you can whisper. If you're in whispering distance, the enemy dare not come close. And we can be trained. How I thank you in Jesus' precious name. I thank you for your offer of your transformation, for I am not worthy of it never have been and never will be I thank you by your great grace because you wanted to proclaim what you have done and will do for the Gentiles I thank you I had no right to it and still don't it is by your grace that you make these things available and I accept it receive it from you and I praise you and thank you in Jesus name Amen Amen Amen. Well, we made it to page two of our notes. We'll pick up from there. Maybe in our next session, we'll find out how the Spirit leads. If God was speaking to you in the midst of the instruction, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. If you want to make proclamation that you really heard something from your God, you gained a new truth from Him, and you want to keep that truth in your heart. We're just going to give you a few moments to do this. So let's be quick about it. How did God speak to you? Let's bow our hearts for a moment. How did the Lord speak to you? Raise your hand when you're ready. Last call. Something I saw tonight that I have not seen before. When I had saw the destitute of my own soul, I had pleaded with the Lord to kill the will within me. But he has shown me it's not the will that needs to die. That is his gift to me. What needs to happen is the will needs to be purified, sanctified, cleansed, and aligned with him. I have not ever seen that before. And I don't even know how to do it. But I know he does. Thank you, Lord. Lord, not our will, but yours be done. Anyone else? Rosie? God's showing me how I need the important thing in being able to stand is that I'm abiding in his presence, that I'm sitting with him and, and listening to his teaching, that I'm being trained by him and that I'm standing upon him my rock and that he will strengthen me in him I am strengthened abiding in him only in him can I stand amen um, I just want to confess that I've really been um, more focused on on all the arrows that have hit me lately instead of on who the healer is and who the arrow pick you know puller is and and um, and I just I just want I'm I'm so grateful for a different perspective 
and um, and I want my focus to be on him and not myself. Anyone else? Tonight when the Lord spoke about a wall being around us, it, it, he, he emphasized uh, what I heard out of that was that uh, it was a wall that defined our freedom and our liberty. And uh, there was a tremendous contrast between what was in the wall and what was on one side of the wall and what was on the other side of the wall. And I just heard that again confirmed in the, uh, in the preaching of the Word this evening. And um, I'm, so, I'm so grateful He builds walls. And, uh, I don't want to push against them. And I just confess, Lord, that I've done that at times. I, I've been a Jack Russell. I've chased out through the weeds and the brambles. And, and I thank you for coming and rescuing me and bringing me back, Lord, and placing me in a body that loves you. And, and uh, to hear your word tonight, Lord, that you come to rescue. Thank you for rescuing me. I love the, the scripture in Jeremiah. What a wonderful, um, what wonderful insight to um, the Lord's ways of, of um, and what He's after in us. That harbor, that little place that we are protecting, and um, and how He is the one that is going to He just the. Um, just knowing that when he does send the army after us, that it's not for punishment or um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it has no reflection upon his love or concern for us. It has everything to do with what he, the that harbor that he's after, and um, that's just a, a wonderful. Um, picture and to have that perspective of what um, he is truly after um, uh, that was just wonderful I didn't finish in Jeremiah 4 18 which this is also prophetic about our Lord Jesus because he bore our actions it says your conduct and actions have brought this upon you this is your punishment. How bitter it is. How it pierces to the heart. Do you catch that? Our Lord Jesus was pierced. He hung up on the cross and received the punishment for my actions. I brought it upon him. Anyone else have the Lord speak to you in the Word? Merely. Always I have heard the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth to find an intercessor. And I saw this scripture, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And I thought, that's not what I hear quoted very often. And so much of the New Testament says it's His power, His strength. And I think how easy it is for me if I'm in a battle with the enemy to try and do it myself. And then, I, and then the enemy says, well, you failed. You're not. You can't even resist the enemy. The enemy is talking about himself and dragging me into it. And I'm thinking... Oh no, I want the Lord to see me and strengthen my heart. Him strengthen my heart. So I was touched by that as a number of other things. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Anyone else? Last call. Last call, last call. Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Okay. I remember those days, probably 25 years ago, a lot of talk of even the, the music 
popular Christian music talked about taking up armor and a child inside the armor and doing great things but there was never any talk of maturity never any talk of we were never taught you have to take the time to become mature to understand what each tool does what each facet of the armor does and how to put it on and we were never taught because it was very almost politi well, politically correct religiously correct but there was never any depth to the understanding and I even the time you spent tonight it is absolutely critical that we gain a the, and each one of us is different. Each one of us has a, a bit of maturity or, or, or age, if you will, to us. But we have to be mature as God defines mature in order to f comprehend and understand what we're putting on and how to use those things. And 25 years ago, we were just we were ignorant. I mean, blissfully ignorant. And uh, <coughs> I can't imagine all the arrows the enemy slung at all of us in those days, and we never knew it. In fact, we were so ignorant we didn't even we couldn't even see the arrows in other people, let alone ourselves. So, thank you for bringing this up. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Lord, for bringing this up. If you've had situations and circumstances, relationships, finances, businesses that were hit with arrows from time past, if there was destruction in times past, no, you took arrows and you didn't have shields. If you've been, ever been deceived in any business deal, any relationship, any functionality, in the things you do on a daily basis, know this you've been deceived you don't have the helmet on because you're misled so at that time we really faced the facts of wait a minute I, i've been making the wrong decisions how can this be how can i be influenced by the enemy if i have the helmet pulled down we don't have it on jesus fully had it on and he was able to stand against every scheme of satan that he had on earth so we need to go back and examine. How do we get these things on? God, richly bless you. Any last comment? With that? If y'all can help put up the stuff. I know some of you are faithful in doing that. If others could help in that, that would be greatly appreciated. God bless you, and we'll see you on Wednesday.